Athlete Mindset is part of the CadSource Podcast Network. At CadSource, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching CadSource on your social media app of choice. This is the Athlete Mindset Podcast, and it's all about mental health in sports. Presented and produced by Sports E Plus, part of the CadSource Podcast Network. Athlete Mindset is hosted by Lisa Bontasumi. Lisa is a therapist and mental performance consultant to high-performing athletes at the youth, collegiate, and professional levels. Lisa also works with teams, coaches, and other members of the sports ecosystem. The Athlete Mindset Podcast is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. I am Eric Kazimov, founder of CadSource and the creator of Sports U+. I'm hosting the Athlete Mindset Podcast on this platform as I deeply believe these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. My name is Lisa Bontasumi. I am a therapist and mental performance consultant, and I am the mental performance coach for the Oakland Roots. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work you do at the Oakland Roots? Yes, of course. So this is my third season working with the club. It's been amazing. Mental health in general in sports has evolving just as my position has evolved and will continue to evolve, I'm sure, season to season. Just the climate of mental health and the organization, the coaches, personnel, staff, they all shift and change. And so my role will evolve as needed. This season, I will be the mental performance coach in sport. So on the field slash pitch and in life. Athletes perform in life, in their relationships, you know, in their extracurricular activities, in their other identities, in their family. They have to be present and ready to engage with their life. So part of my job is to make sure that they feel as mentally strong there and that they're as healthy all the way around in their entire well-being to engage with life in a way that feels good to them. The other part of my job is the mental performance side on the field slash pitch where we do particular skills training for their performance on the field. So if there is performance anxiety or a lack of focus or an inability to concentrate fully or a challenge in regulating their emotions in certain high-demand, high-performing situations, I help build the skills to be able to manage those moments. And so together, holistically, I'm able to impact and strengthen and train the brain and the mental performance that comes from that in their lives, because they are human beings, and in their sport as footballers. For athletes listening, like what's an easy mental health tool you can share that you've seen be impactful on the field? My favorite, it's easy, is a deep breath. Sometimes we forget that we have access to our breath. It can change our whole physiology. It can calm our heart rate. It can get us back to center and back to present. And I just say, let's just use a simple box breath. So what that is, is inhaling for four, staying at the top for four, exhaling for four, and staying at the bottom for four. If you just do one of those, you're going to change your whole mindset, your whole physiology, your whole ability to be present. You can do a couple of those depending on where you're at in the game, in practice, in training session. It depends how many you can do or want to do, but that's an easy, easy, accessible one that can get you again back to present and back into focus. You're a mental performance coach at the Oakland Roots. You're a private practice clinician with over 21 years of clinical experience. And you're the CEO and founder of Ath Mindset. Take us through the beginning of the journey to now. Like, how did you get to this point in your career? Yeah, it's been an awesome journey, an awesome ride. And I'm absolutely 100% 
in it for the rest of the ride, wherever it might go. And I kind of like that. I don't know. But I became a therapist at a pretty young age. I went from straight from undergrad to be year off and then straight into graduate school. So I had my master's in clinical social work around age 23. And, you know, it was the best personal and professional experience I've ever had. I came from a family where I was put in a position to kind of caretake and manage relationships, help others manage their relationships. And so I was kind of already trained to be that listener, that therapist before I even knew what therapy was. So I went to graduate school, got my license over years of experience and supervision. And let's take a quick pin. I was a competitive soccer player in high school. So I had that experience going into my education, but I had my own mental health struggles going into my college years, freshman and sophomore year, because I got injured and could not continue to play at the collegiate level, which was my dream. My parents didn't have the wherewithal or resources to really support me physically and mentally in my recovery. So I put that aside. I put that aside. I focused on my new identity as a growing and a practicing clinician. So just have that kind of pinned in the side. So I'm doing my thing. I'm working with lots of different populations in the San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland, East Bay in general. And I'm playing sports, but not competitively. I'm exercising. I'm doing this thing. Life goes on. I get married. I have two kids. My oldest is a 16-year-old high-performing softball player. And so she was struggling at one time with perfectionism, lack of belief, you know, if I suck on the field, I suck as a person type of mentality. And myself and my husband, who's also a therapist, we were like, I think we have some skills and tools and like perspectives, strategies for her to kind of change those mistaken beliefs, shift and restructure and reshape her cognition and her thinking. And while doing that, I was like, yo, I can help my daughter, which is very rewarding. And then I was like, what? I kind of like this. I like working with the athlete who is my daughter. And so I was able to work with their team and their whole organization, which was about five teams at the time. And it was really cool. And I was like, wait, oh my God, I'm getting reconnected. Like I'm feeling re-inspired and reconnected with my old former athlete self. And I was like, you know what? I need to like face into and lean into that trauma that I had and not just keep pushing it away. So when I was able to do that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to pivot and work with athletes. So I went back to school got, you know, in the process of finalizing this last certification, but it's something that we already do. And it's just me wanting the gold standard in there and to be recognized by other organizations and other professionals for the work that I do. And so that's when it all started. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes kind of thing, right? Your kids teach you so much about yourself. And she helped me do some healing, some very important healing that I needed to do. Now I feel like 25 years younger. I'm like, loving every moment of what I do. And in that, you know, as the mental performance coach for The Roots, the visibility has brought other people kind of coming to me and saying, hey, you do this for The Roots. Can you do this for my school? Can you do this for my team? Can you do this for my kid? I'm like, uh, I would love to. I'm only one person, but I needed to respond to that need. And so I built AF Mindset alongside my husband, who is the COO, and building a team of other licensed mental health clinicians and mental performance consultants to serve at the youth, collegiate, Olympic, hopeful, and professional levels. So being able to do that, but also being able to professionally develop and give these up-and-coming clinicians and consultants the opportunity to work in sports, which is something a lot of people want to do or don't have access to. So that's really important for me to give that opportunity and that give them support in basically honing their craft and being able to practice in it. So that's kind of where Ath Mindset is. It's that team, but it's also... I have a podcast that I do where I interview athletes, former athletes, and individuals in the sport ecosystem who want to talk about athlete mental health from their own lived experience or from their own perspective. We have an athlete brand ambassador division as well. So we have two professional athletes there. We have multiple partnerships. So... It's a growing, growing company. It's super exciting. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some days where I'm like, this is kind of hard. But I've been through hard before. I know what it's like to face adversity and like come out on the other end and 
meeting really cool people and nurturing and deepening those relationships is really what keeps me going and like having really meaningful conversations and like really living in my purpose and my values every day is really, really, really important to me. So that's F mindset. Is there a singular moment from growing up that you knew that you wanted to work in mental health? I'm curious, like, especially after college, that switch from a traditional mental health setting to like the pitch was the catalyst for that, that your daughter and her performance on the field? Yes, the catalyst to shift from sort of like general mental health with across various populations to shift to athletes was her story, her experience. But if we go back to why I was a therapist to begin with, even before working with athletes and teams, is again, the dynamic in my home that I grew up in that I was already sort of, it's like second nature to be a helper to help and deepen people's communication with their relationships and significant people in their lives. So if there was something I could do as a profession where I feel like I've been doing that since I was a kid, then cool, bring it on. And so the athlete population is also a vulnerable population. And I work and have worked in my entire career with marginalized populations. And people don't realize that even the highest performing professional athlete is a vulnerable population because they have particular stressors and areas that they need to really continue to focus on that's significant and unique to their experience and their lives. So people think, oh, athletes, they make all this money and they get to travel to all these places. Why would they ever have anything challenging about their mental health to even deal with? Well, that's like a uninformed, very sort of non-inclusive way of looking at the athlete experience. And so that diving deep into that and like digging into it was really important that it's always at the forefront of my mind that athletes are humans and that's who they are first and foremost. Like their job is to play soccer in this case with the roots. That's their job and part of their identity. But it's so much more complex than that. Personally, you know, I've seen the stigma associated with mental health. I'm curious, like for athletes, for folks that you work with that don't see that value, like how do you demonstrate it to them? I try to break it down. I think the reason why the stigma is there is because there's a lot of misinformation Like people think that mental health and mental illness are synonymous, that they mean the same thing when they don't. So I try to like dismantle and break down that myth first and foremost, give proper information, accurate information. And then I break down what mental health is. When we really look at it in its simplest forms is it's how we think, feel, and behave and how we respond to the stressors and adversity in life and how we connect to the relationships in our life. That's what mental health is. Notice I didn't say it's depression, it's anxiety, it's an eating disorder, it's schizophrenia. I didn't say any of that. So when I'm able to like really give people proper information because our society like hasn't been able to do that as a whole, that's really an eye-opening kind of moment for people. And then I can also talk about what mental illness is, that it is a diagnosable condition that impacts areas of your life, areas of your ability to function in your relationships at work, at school, things like that, and that you can be mentally healthy even if you have a diagnosis. You know, what I was asking is because in my own family, I've seen issues there with that stigma. And really, I guess like what I wanted to ask too was, how you've been able to make the work sustainable for yourself over the years, especially with that pushback, with that stigma associated to mental health? I think the people who come to me, like coming to therapy is voluntary in most situations, right? Or wanting to work on one's mental health. There's already a value that you have to come to want to work on it in a therapeutic situation or with a mental performance consultant. There's a value you already know that there's something there. So some value there, right? And so I've been able to sustain myself over the years because there's a lot of people who value it. I also use my clinical skills in different ways. I do workshops, presentations, supervision of other up-and-coming therapists. So there's a way to make a living off of it, so to speak. When I'm like with the Oakland Roots, right? And I don't choose who my sort of my people are who I work with, they're the roster designates you know, who my people are, then it's a little bit different. There is the mental performance side and then there's the therapy side. 
the mental performance side, the approach that we take at the roots is that everybody can benefit from working on how they engage their brain and how they design their mental game. Everyone. I mean, haven't we heard this over the years, like 80 to 90% of every sport is mental, right? But we don't ever talk about it. Okay. So go be mental then. Go use your brain. Go use that. But we don't give people, athletes, specific strategies or skills or tools to engage their mind in their ability to perform and thus then perform better physically and then thus win, which everybody wants to do that is win. But it's the process that we take to get to that finish line, quote unquote. We do value the process over the outcome and believe that the outcome will come, the wins will come if we focus on this process. So that's the mental performance side. As far as therapy goes, so I wanted to say a little bit more about the mental performance side for The Roots. It is my job to create a mental training program for every athlete on the roster. That is my job. And so I use my skills in that profession to do so. And then it's integrated into the whole holistic way we care for our players, whether it's through strength and conditioning, coaching, athletic training, sports medicine. We all are a collaborative team to make sure that our athletes are healthy overall. So that's the mental performance side. Therapy, because I do both, is an option for the guys. They can decide if they want to engage in therapy with me. There's a lot of different consents, different paperwork, et cetera. I won't get into the nitty gritty of it. But that's an option. It's an option because again, at the roots, we value the whole human being. You know, if they are doing well, feel well, feel positive in their personal lives, they will perform better on the field, period. And so we want to give them that option, but there are a lot of like laws and regulations around confidentiality and things like that that we have to consider and the ways that I'm able to talk about that work, but it is offered. It is offered. And some of the guys meet with me in an office that I have at the facility for sessions before training. They come early before prehab or we do virtual sessions. So that, again, is an option. So that's how I approach it. And that's the work with the roots. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to comment personally the impact that therapy has had on my own life, on the pitch, off the pitch. I think that. I mean, at least for me, I know that if I'm speaking negatively to myself, I'm going to perform negatively. I think a lot about it is just how it is that you're talking to yourself. And sometimes, or at least especially at the beginning, I didn't even realize that I was speaking to myself in that way. So self-talk is a mental tool that helps in the development of the mental skill of self-confidence. Bam. Like, I don't think even a lot of people know that self-confidence is a skill you can develop. People often think that, oh, you're either born with it or you're not. It's not true. So when we are able to know that we can be empowered in the way that we talk to ourselves and have some agency there, that self-confidence will grow. So our emotions will change. The way we think about ourselves will change. And then thus how we behave in the world will change. So it's super powerful, you know, like... I love being able to introduce these tools and skills to my players and like have them actually try them and like feel a difference. That means everything. Yeah, I'm actually thinking of my therapist. I remember one of the things that you know I was working on was just actually taking the time, you know, like a minute out of your day to like say something nice to yourself. And I remember like looking at the mirror and doing this, like how awful it felt at first, like just corny, you know. And then as I progressively, as I did it, I started to feel that way. I could feel myself sort of changing in the way that I was looking at myself and how I was feeling about me. And like that, at the end of the day, that winds up impacting everything that you're doing. If it's on the field or if it's at work or with family or friends, if you're not well, then you probably will reflect that. That's right. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. I think a lot of my clients are like, that's like super cheesy or even cringe to like, say that like that's corny i'm like that's fine i think it's because that's what society tells us it is right so if we can challenge that and realize that we deserve 
to talk positively and kindly to ourselves with compassion, then we are in a position then to make sure that other people talk to us that way. And that is so important. Very, very important. Moving the conversation to the Bay, like how did you wind up in Oakland? Like what's the story there? So when I came back from graduate school, I actually lived in San Francisco for about nine years. And then I met my boyfriend, now my husband, at the time who was living in Oakland during that time. And so we started dating, long story short, we got engaged. And when I got engaged, I moved to Oakland with him. So that's how I got to Oakland. Both my kids were born in Oakland, you know, a special place for us. We did end up moving to Alameda, but we like Alameda and we like that we're close to Oakland still and that the training facility is close by, Laney's close by. We can access all that is Oakland anytime we want, which is beautiful. Not everyone knows like the magic and beauty of Oakland. Like there's so many stereotypes. If you're not from here, like Oakland's the hood, like what? It's dangerous. Why do we even want to go there? But you know, there's real people in real hardship and there's a lot of marginalized communities and people in Oakland, but there's also different parts of Oakland and that sometimes that mosaic, that diversity is what makes Oakland beautiful. So I wouldn't live anywhere else. You've talked about the origins of your work in mental health, you know, a bit about the impact that Oakland has had on your life. Switching gears just a bit, can you speak personally to the role that sports played in your life? I know you mentioned you were a soccer player. Uh, Was there any other sports you were playing or watching? It's so interesting. Like soccer came into my life accidentally, or I don't even know if I believe in that. Not accidentally, that, you know, unplanned. I should say. So my mom and dad couldn't pick me up from my after-school program at one point. So my best friend's mom agreed to take me home, but I had to go to her daughter's soccer practice first before they could take me home because that was the plan. And of course, my parents were like, please, you know, we don't have any other options. So here I am coming along to Colleen. I remember her name too, Colleen's practice. And so we're there. The coach saw, I mean, how old was I? Seven. Like I had a knack for the ball. I I wanted to be out there. I asked if I could join the practice and the rest is history. Played till I was 18, like I said, and then my brothers played too. We come from a, you know, play soccer players. I tried softball at the rec level, volleyball, other things, but soccer was my sport. My brothers tried wrestling, baseball, basketball, swimming, everything. And soccer was where they landed too. My niece, played collegiately and is now training with the Philippine women's national team. So soccer is our thing. That's our vibe. And I think for me, soccer helped me grow as a girl into a woman. It helped me to find my voice. It helped me to communicate with my teammates and thus other people in my life. Soccer gave me a sense of purpose. And honestly, it was my outlet, my safe place. I love being around my teammates. I loved running around and having a shared goal and that we all had a role to play in that shared goal. It quote unquote kept me off the streets. I'll just be very frank. And I think that as a young girl in the environment that I grew up in, I probably would have either been addicted to a substance or pregnant as a teenager if it wasn't for soccer. And so it helped me express myself in a healthy way. It gave me a place to go, a place to be. So I don't know who I'd be today without it, but it taught me so many skills that are applicable to real life, my life, the relationships that I have. And so I'm like so grateful that my daughter has found a sport that she digs and is investing in and like has fun doing. Like I had to grieve and like let it go that it wasn't soccer, but like that's a whole nother story. It doesn't matter. She doesn't have to do what I did. But as long as she finds something, my son who's eight, he's searching for his physical and sport exercise outlet. I think it's very, very beneficial for just the development of us as physically fit humans, knowing the power of our body and our minds and like just having a place to express ourselves. Absolutely. I was going to ask you why this sport, like why soccer? And to hear you speak about it so poetically brings me so much joy. 
I just can really relate with a lot of what you're saying. Like there's like this chemistry, like this jazz, even like this improvisation that happens when it's like a, a team thing. And like to see the ball move up the field and like you can kind of see like the play is happening before they do if like a team's really good. All that when you take into account the individual and then the group's dynamic is incredible. It's so awesome. Well, we're cutting you off because I'm so excited. But I think like being proud of your teammates too, seeing them like do things that they probably don't even feel like they can and like being able to witness that. And then that encourages you to do the same. And then you're cheering each other on. It's super cool in so many ways. Yeah. I remember playing rec league and I was a defender more, but I remember each and every goal that I scored, it was only three, but that feeling, you know, and like, it's like you're on top of the world is rec league, right? But when you're a little kid, you don't know, you know, it's like the best feeling ever. And oftentimes we would still lose, (laughs) but it didn't even matter. And then, yeah, that communal aspect of it and like the pizza parties and like hanging out with everyone, you know, it's, and you're out there having fun with your friends. Like, who could be mad at that? Absolutely. I mean, it's so cool. Is there a pivotal sports moment for you from growing up that you can share with us, like from playing soccer? Like, I know you had mentioned your entry, but maybe something that was more positive. Yeah, I think that my junior and senior year on my high school team, which we were all, pardon my French, we were all badasses, but we can add that. We were all very high level players on our club teams as well. And so to come together on our high school team was super cool. And to know those girls so well and to really have a great coach in high school. I know not everyone can say that as they, you know, reflect on their coaches throughout their lives. This was a very special one. She really made sure that she had us bond with each other, know each other, She was doing sports psychology before I think it was even a thing, but I loved the culture that she built and the way that we all had each other's back. In high school, we all have cliques, right? We all are like, you're the jock or the punk rocker or the blah, blah, whatever, right? But when you're on the field, all that stuff falls away. You wear one uniform, you're all, you know, it's a time to come together, even if we don't speak to each other in the halls of our high school. But like we come together for one purpose, one goal, and we each have a role and we value that and appreciate it because we know one person can't do everything. But I think being able to build off that and then actually win championships those two years at the end of my career there really, really, really sticks with me. My mom, it's so funny. She took a newspaper clip from one of the articles of like, oh, Lisa Bonta like scores the winning goal. And like she has a newspaper clip and she framed it. And it's like, she lives with us and it's in our garage. I'm like, really? I'm going to keep looking at it? But that's what moms do and I appreciate it. But it's like, I can look at it now and not be embarrassed and be like, yo, I own that. Like, I can smile at that. Like, that's cool. I'm a mom now, so I can appreciate it. But I think those two years, especially my senior year, that meant a lot. And just afterwards celebrating as a team, not really knowing the sort of brevity of it. It's like such a big deal. But we're like just kids, like, oh, we're just playing our game. Like, okay, cool. We won. Yay. Let's go eat. So I think that's really cool. And the women, the girls who I experienced that with, my teammates, and it's just, you know, really cool. Yeah. You're making me reflect that I remember going to Spain a couple of years back and going to a professional football match out there. I remember like, that sound of like the crowd you could hear it from like blocks away and then like the closer you got it felt like the building was shaking like that roar there's really like nothing like that i mean you see that at roots games now if you go or you know nba games or nfl games nhl games you can feel that and i guess the question i have is like why do you think we as humans do that like what role do sports play in community what do you feel sports communicate to us No, it's a great question. I mean, I think sport reflects life, right? And in those moments you're describing, that is the expression of the best way that we can relate to one another as human beings on this earth. You know, that like there's going to be bad days, bad moments, tough times, and that buzz or that hum of humanity at a higher pitch, you know, at a higher level where we're all there happy for each other, that's different. That's different. And I think sports unites us. 
sports is an equal playing field. Like you can come and pick up a game anywhere, no matter if you're a man, woman, trans, black, white, brown, rich, poor, it equals it. We're all out there. So that's what I think for me, what makes when we talk about soccer or football being the beautiful game, it can unite us. It can bring us together. It can help us all live and exist on that higher plane. I couldn't agree more. I think in sports, often there's, I mean, if not through the whole thing, there's storytelling. Those like legendary things that like, honestly, even that I felt like my own teammates did like in rec league, like what you like headed that in? Like, how did you, you know, that feeling, right? That feeling of like, I don't know, it's at the same time you can feel that joy. And then when you lose and you feel that defeat, right? It's like, you feel like that opposite, but that human condition to try, like you said, to equalize, like it's so inspiring. And you're never alone, right? You're never alone in your celebration. You're never alone when it doesn't go well, whatever that is. That's the other thing too, I think about sports. Even if you play a sport where it's, you're an individual out there competing, you still have a team. And just all of that is just super, super powerful, meaningful. And that's why it's so important that our youth understand how sports can unite us and connect us. I'm actually going to Jordan on Monday for a women's soccer exchange where in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Sports Diplomacy and World Learning, we're going to be able to, there's five of us traveling from the United States to speak to the national and junior national women's football team out in Jordan. We are going to interface with the Jordan Olympic Committee and the Jordan Football Federation out there. And this is going to be my, I think, most tender moving part. We're going to be able to go to a refugee camp and play some soccer and talk to the families and there at the refugee camp and just interact and be there with them and play and talk. And so, I'm like beyond humbled to be able to participate in something like this. It just brings me back to like why I do this, you know, why it's so impactful that we as a country are privileged to have a lot of resources. And it is our responsibility, in my opinion, to bring those resources and those skills and learning and intellectual property to other countries like Jordan who might not have access to those. So I lose sleep for the last few weeks, a little bit every night with excitement for it. And so again, without soccer, I wouldn't have this opportunity. So I'm deeply grateful. Absolutely. And as we've been talking about the passion in sports is reflected by the passion that you find in community. Can you speak to the role that community played in your own upbringing and what ways did your community raise you? So at an early age, myself and my siblings were taught that community involvement, community activism was very important. And so the ways that I was involved in my community, the Filipino community, the athletic community, my friendships were very much shaped by that value to be able to contribute to society and be a part of a strong community is really important. My dad actually was the first in his family to ever go to college. And he went to Cal out here, go Bears. And he got a scholarship to study physics here at Cal. And I say here at Cal because it's a hop, skip, and a jump from where we are here in Oakland, Alameda. But while he was there, some friends of his were mailing him some tapes of this person that was like giving me speeches that were like out of this world, super inspiring. I say tapes and some people are like, what the heck's a tape? Back in the day, we had cassette tapes people before the digital industry came up with like (laughs) all the options for technology now to stream and download everything. So we had tapes. So they were mailing him these tapes and he was listening. He's like, who is this person? Oh my God. And it really moved him and he kept listening and they were like, come meet us. Come meet us. We're going to do this march. You can meet this person that we've been sending you tapes on. It was Martin Luther King Jr. And so he, along with the constituents of others, white allies, 
others interested in the ministry went and marched alongside Martin Luther King Jr. He brings that experience to our family. My mother is an immigrant from the Philippines. She came here on a scholarship to study religious education. They met in Berkeley at their graduate school and then did their missionary work in the Philippines, where myself and my brother were born, my oldest brother. And then after that work, went and worked for Cesar Chavez. And we lived in the Tehachapi Mountains above Bakersfield. And again, that community, the importance for community activism and involvement continued to grow. And we saw it. My youngest brother was born in Bakersfield. We lived in a trailer. My mom taught at the preschool. My dad did some public policy work and curriculum development and activism alongside Cesar Chavez. So these relationships and interactions like have shaped how me and my brother show up to the world, how we serve, how we are involved in giving back, how we recognize our privilege and uplift others who might not have the same. We all do it differently in our areas of our professions, but it's instilled in us deeply. And I think when you ask me about community, that's what I think about. On a broader level, why is it important for your followers, for Oakland Roots fans, for our listeners to have that same passion off the field and show up and get involved consistently in community? I think it's essential. It's our responsibility. We are one piece of a big puzzle. When one person is well, mentally and physically, and in their passion and in their purpose, it helps others. It inspires others to do the same. Like the stories that we tell about our lives might be painful at times to connect with, but they're inspiration to others. Like let our adversity be someone's uplift, like someone's gift. We don't exist in any kind of silo. And the beauty of Oakland and the way that the roots show up in Oakland, a purpose-driven club, community service-oriented, social justice-oriented, an anti-racist club is so important. Like this is a club that like reflects me (laughs) and who I stand for. And so to express myself within this organization is just extra. Just another way that it's all aligned for me. And when I'm in my purpose and passion, I'm able to help people in a better way, in a more healthy way, in a way that is pure. So I think any way that anyone in Oakland can get involved in their community, recognize their gifts, resources come in many different ways, not just financially, the skills, the gifts that you have to share with others means everything and matters. And don't think like you don't have anything to offer because you do. And get behind the roots. Have some fun. You know, after a long day's work, come to a game and hang out. It's a party if you haven't gone. You got to check it out. Our club does a real good job with the fan experience and makes it a fun, fun evening for the family, for everyone. So I think finding where you fit in, where you feel like you can contribute is a journey, is a process. And like, just jump in, take it, take the journey. How can folks listening support your work? Where can folks find you on social media? So first and foremost, I'm the mental performance coach for the Oakland Roots. So you can follow us, the Oakland Roots, anywhere, LinkedIn, Twitter, IG, me personally, those same platforms. Just put in Lisa, Bonta, Sumi, you'll find me. And then also my company, Ask Mindset, is also on all three of those platforms. But I'll be real because this is Roots Radio. This is Richie I'm talking to. This is my community here. Text me. For real. 415-254-0149. I pride myself in always returning any email, any text. It might not be in the time frame you prefer, but I will always 100%, unless something goes wrong with technology or somehow I make a note to return your connection or your outreach and somehow it gets lost, That'd be the only reason I do not respond. That's my responsibility. If you feel like you're moved enough to contact me, it's the least I can do to respond. So those are all the different ways that you can connect with me. On Roots Radio, our guest always gets the last word. Based on our conversation, what's the last thing you want to share with our listeners? Athletes are human beings, first and foremost, and should be treated as such. 
You, whoever's listening, are enough. You are loved. You're a part of something bigger. You belong. You are valued. So all aspects of who you are should be cared for and have compassion and understanding for yourself. And just love, love, love yourself, love others, share love, bring love to every space that you have the fortunate privilege to occupy. Athlete Mindset is part of the CadSource Podcast Network. At CadSource, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching CadSource on your social media app of choice. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network, the CadSource Podcast Network. 